Welcome back, everybody. Um, thanks so much for um, participating in the workshop and the um, engaging discussion this morning to open us off. Um, from Miriam, I don't know if she's uh, able to stay with us. Oh, there she is. That's great. Um, but we'll move on uh, into some panel sessions that we've planned um, for the workshop. The first of these will be focusing on the, the publishing research articles process. But uh, in all of these panels, <clears throat> our goal is to is to understand, you know, how this is unfolding um, across the uh, across the uh, criteria and goals that Miriam outlined for the for the memo and the public access direction in general. So this first panel. Um, uh, we'll focus for focus on four speakers, and I will just jump right in so that we can get going. And I thank you very much for your patience with me because I'm just jumping into this. I wasn't planning on speaking publicly today. So, um, first speaker is uh, Brian Hitson. He's the director of the U.S. Department of uh, Energy's Office of Science and Technical Information, so OSTE. OSTE fulfills agency-wide responsibilities to collect, preserve, and disseminate scientific and technical information animating from DOE-funded research. <clears throat> In support of guidance from the OSTP, Brian has co-authored both the 2014 and the 2023 DOE public access plans. So this will be great to get the update. Developing strategies for increasing public access to scholarly publications and scientific data from the DOE. Along with DOE um, and OSTE colleagues, he launched, um, he led the launch, thank you, Brian, of the DOE Public Access Gateway for Energy and Science, or DOE Pages. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. He also formed partnerships with the National Science Foundation and Department of Defense in increasing public access to those agencies' R&D results as well. Um, and his directories led strategic efforts to improve discoverability and linkages between diverse and related research objects, including publications and data sets and scientific software at OST, uh, OSTE.gov. <clears throat> he also represents the DOE in interagency and international open science initiatives and organizations. Brian holds a BA in, in economics and an MBA from the University of Tennessee. Thanks so much, Brian. Thank you for that introduction, and uh, it's a great privilege, privilege to be here. Linda, I want to thank you and your team for uh, prepping us uh, speakers. Uh, you've done such a great job, and uh, always a privilege to be joining in this session with uh, members of academia and the publishing society, uh, communities and societies, and so a uh, real pri privilege there. And I really do want to give a shout out uh, because uh, the federal colleagues that I work with across agencies work so hard together in this whole endeavor. So Miriam, uh, just do an outstanding job leading at a government-wide level, all public access efforts. And Bob Hanish, my colleague from NS, NS, uh, NIST, will uh, uh, talk about the uh, data piece of it this afternoon. He's just a national leader in data, data infrastructure and data thought in general. So Bob, really enjoy being here with you too. Um, I am from the Department of Energy, uh, and uh, I wanna talk a little bit about our journey uh, through public access, primarily in that in that time frame of 2013, the Holder Memo to the 2022 Nelson Memo and beyond. I want to go back in time about DOE's public access mission for decades, uh, and then just uh, end with sort of what Miriam talked about this concept of open science and how the public access policies are really enabling open science practices. With any luck, my, my remote will be work better than Miriam's. Uh, so I want to start off here with, with this kind of uh, very big picture of DOE's mission. Uh, DOE, a, a, a very big agency, having a budget over $30 billion per year, about half of that going to research in the energy sciences, uh, physical sciences. Uh, that money flows from Congress to our program offices within DOE and then to our 17 national laboratories and many hundreds of grantee institutions and universities. Uh, all of those entities are doing just amazing work in research and development in the energy sciences. And the most immediate outcome of their work is recorded in the forms of scientific and technical information that you see here, publications for sure. Um, the peer review publications being those journal articles and accepted, accepted manuscripts, but also technical reports, conference papers, and so forth. And as, as, as Mary mentioned, data sets, software, patents, other forms of scientific and technical information. And out of that $15 billion investment, 
uh, we generate about 50,000 R&D or SDR products per year. So uh, within, within uh, the federal government, um, in terms of those journal article publications, this pie chart gives you a sense of which agencies are producing the largest volumes of journal articles. NIH and NSF, certainly the biggest share. NS, uh, DOE uh, generating 25 to 27,000 articles per year. And then a whole host, host of other agencies producing very meaningful quantities of journal articles. In the DOE, if you if you extract that just the journal article piece and think about the disciplines within those journal articles, because we are the largest U.S. funder of research in the physical sciences, makes perfect sense that uh, we have published many articles in physics and chemistry or chemical chemical engineering, very relevant to this workshop. But you see a host of other agents uh, disciplines as well. Uh, now, if you total these up, they will definitely total to. Uh, uh, more than the journal articles we've uh, cited, but there are in many cases you get more than one subject category assigned to a, a given article. Now, within DOE, uh, the responsibility for providing public access to that content falls to my organization, the Office of Scientific and Technical Information, or OSTI, within DOE. And we've had this mission uh, for providing public access to our R&D results Way before the Holdren Memo in 2013, we started it in 1947 when we were established as part of the Atomic Energy Commission. I hope most of you have seen the Oppenheimer movie, you know, the Manhattan Project that led to uh, classified research for winning the war. But uh, right after the war, uh, people quickly turned to declassifying that information, using that research information for peaceful purposes. That led to the Atomic Energy Commission, and along with the Atomic Energy Commission, OSTI was formed to be that arm of DOE that, that does that declassification, making that information available to the public. Uh, there have been various pieces of legislation that reiterate OSTI's mission in doing that, the most notable one being the 2005 Energy Policy Act uh, that talked about the secretary through OSTI shall maintain within DOE these publicly available collections of scientific and technical information. So the visual on the left there, is the umbrella search tool by which we make uh, all of that content accessible, going all the way back to the Manhattan Project to the present, uh, where we provide three plus million records going all the way back to that period in time to the present through OSTI.gov. Uh, after the 2013 uh, Holdren memo that Miriam mentioned, uh, we established this DOE pages or the public access gateway for energy and science as our repository for those journal articles. Prior to 2013, most agencies didn't have sort of the ump for the authority to get into the full text of the journal articles. Uh, it, it was the Holder memo that gave us that. And so pages represents that for DOE and we're up to two, close to 200,000 articles. Um, You'll think about, if you'll think about OSTI analogs and other agencies, what other parts of those agencies uh, do the same kind of missions, the National Library of Medicine, the biggest and best uh, known, we all look there for health conditions and diseases, affect us or our families, a great resource. In DOD, the Defense Technical Information Center performs this kind of mission. There are national libraries and departments of agriculture and transportation. NASA has an STI program. And prior to the 2013 memo, NSF didn't really have an OSTI analog because they didn't have that, that mission, but they needed to establish a repository. So they partnered with DOE and we host and develop for them their NSF public access repository, just a wonderful partnership, a strategic partnership for us. And so we really value that relationship. So uh, some of this I am going to re repeat in a slightly different way from what Miriam had talked about. But what got it all started as far as agencies getting into the peer-reviewed publications piece of this and making the full text of that accessible was the John Holder memo. And it focused largely on providing increased access to peer-reviewed publications and digital data. I won't talk so much about data. That'll be uh, Bob and uh, the afternoon session talking about that. But with respect to the publications, it allows for this one-year embargo, as, as Miriam mentioned. And so just as with the 2022 Nelson memo, with the Holder memo, we also had to develop a public access plan, first and foremost, was our plan. And our plan uh, in the publications model, uh, part of that with at least, uh, talked about uh, what I would call is mostly a green open access path for achieving that. The authors 
from our from our laboratories and grantees needed to submit to us their accepted manuscripts within 12 months of publication. We had the authority to, to collect and disseminate those under what's called a government purpose or federal purpose license, where we retain a copyright in the accepted manuscript to make it publicly accessible. Our model also integrates the voluntary participation of publishers. Publishers were not mandated to do it. We don't have any leverage over a publisher to say you have to participate. Uh, so when a publisher chooses to make their publisher's manuscript accessible or a version of record accessible from pages, we will link out to that uh, version of it as well. And again, pages is the repository. Again, I won't speak much about data management plans. That'll be covered more in the afternoon, but we established like most agencies, a data management plan requirement anytime a funding proposal is made to show how you're gonna make your data more accessible. So over time, we've been quite successful in building up uh, what's available to the public through DOE pages and these journal articles that would not have made, been made accessible to the public had it not been for the Holden memo. Uh, and so year by year, we've been increasing that from our labs and universities, getting up to 200,000 articles per year. Now, a lot of times people will ask, what's been the impact of, over 10 years now of, of these articles becoming more accessible to the public? And there are many different ways of measuring this. This one is an article that I pulled from 2023 um, and a little bit busy, but let me explain it. So on the upper, on the upper visual, it shows the percentage of journal articles that our 17 national laboratories have made accessible since the 2014 ac open access mandate went into effect with the John Holder memo. And so you see that our national laboratories are getting upwards of 90% of their articles becoming accessible as a result of that, of that memo. Uh, and then there's a control group that shows a lesser percent. Uh, the lower visual then shows since 2014, certain communities are citing uh, those articles from our laboratories at much higher rates than they had before those things became accessible. Uh, inventors and small firms communities that never would have had access to these through typical subscriptions. And because they were made freely accessible, they're citing them more in their patent applications. And to me, this is a real economic or commercial advantage of showing how these communities benefit from that. Scientists aren't, aren't citing those articles at any higher rate. And my theory on that is that most scientists have subscriptions through their universities or their national laboratories. So it's, it's not the public access mandate that's benefited them them so much as it is other communities that would have would not have had access to this kind of uh, content. So fast forward to the Nelson memo in 2022 and Miriam touched upon a lot of this uh, and I hope many of you have read the Nelson memo it said uh, the Holder memo everything great everything agencies were doing great uh, keep doing that but we wanna make some key changes to that. One is we want to eliminate that 12 month embargo period to have immediate access to publications. We want agencies to maximize the use and reuse rights of those publications to enable machine readability uh, and to under and to uh, provide immediate access to the data displayed in our underlying pub publications, which is uh, what Miriam and, and Bob mentioned earlier. And, and for the first time, and Mary mentioned this persistent identifiers, this was never mentioned in, in the Holder memo, but persistent identifiers is a big piece of the Nelson memo, and I'll talk more about that in a minute too. So just as we did with the um, uh, Holder memo, we had to develop a public access plan. Today is the, is the one year anniversary that we submitted it to OSTP. We had, we had six months after the, after the memo was issued. So we got it over to OSTP on February 21st. We had a very participative and inclusive process, both within agencies, with other agencies, and with external communities within agency. My parent organization that, that I'm a part of, uh, the Office of Science led it, but we engaged uh, all the major programs in DOE. We engaged research communities on an interagency basis. Mary mentioned the subcommittee in open science. So we're very close to what other agencies are doing, so we learned from them. OSTI has been offering persistent identifier services where we give bids for DOE, DOI sets and software and so forth to other agencies. We learned a lot from that and that's informing our plan. And then obviously we engage many external communities, professional societies, publishers, libraries, and our plan itself tells the public how you can give us, uh, how you can give us input. And that's simply at uh, the email comments at OSTI.gov. 
So our 2020, we got that plan over in, two, in February 23. Uh, Miriam worked very hard and got us approval in it, uh, for it in April of 23, and we're now in the throes of implementing it. Uh, and so again, just as with our original plan, we're very much emphasizing the green open access route where authors can deposit their accepted manuscripts into DOE pages. Uh, we recognize that, uh, sorry, I jumped forward. Um, but we recognize that publishers are very concerned. Some are threatened by this uh, move from a 12 month to a zero embargo. And so they're moving much more aggressively towards gold open access practices and APCs for those. Um, our plan acknowledges that that is an acceptable path for achieving uh, compliance. Um, and so it's an allowable cost to have to have an OAP, OE, OE fee paid from their um, uh, research funding. Uh, but the key word there is uh, is reasonable. Uh, OMB sets out that those costs are allow allowable as so long as they're reasonable. And we're already seeing some uh, OA fees jumping up. Uh, so we're going to track this over time and monitor it very closely. Uh, and uh, at some point, some agencies may have to decide, de define what reasonable means. Uh, and uh, And then with respect to reuse rights, we're certainly going to maximize those within existing copyright laws and rights and data clauses uh, that exist in grants and awards. Uh, Miriam also showed a, a version of this timeline, and I won't go over this too much, but we're right on track with where we need to be. We've uh, satisfied OSTP's requirement to get our plan out and finalized. Uh, we have to get any new requirements or policies in place by the end of 24. Uh, full implementation of those policies by the end of 2025. And then the 26 and 27 numbers have more to do for us in the case of persistent identifiers, getting uh, requirements out for those. So uh, that'll be coming down the pike. Now, I've, um, I have uh, taken the liberty, then I want to transition from the policy piece of this just to the conceptual piece of open science. And I've borrowed this from Wikipedia where you see the different components of, of open science uh, here. And I've taken the liberty of adding the yellow boxes. That's where DOE is really playing a, a big game and some of the discovery tools there. So we're really focusing on getting those publications more openly accessible. Open data software was mentioned. We're, we're doing a whole lot in getting our software accessible. We have discovery tools, DOE code, data explorer, DOE pages for getting those different kinds of outputs more accessible to the public. And then the umbrella search tool of OSTI.gov. Around that, I've drawn this dotted line of persistent identifiers, and Miriam mentioned that. And that's really the connective tissue for uh, getting access across all these diverse research objects. And so uh, the memo itself called for PIDs for research outputs, for researchers themselves, and for R&D awards. So our plan will be covering all three, three of those pieces. Now, I just want to show sort of visually, and I'll, I'll finish up very quickly here. Um, uh, and many of you are seeing this in the tools that you use, but uh, but I just want to show illustrate how PIDs can kind of help you bounce across uh, the research landscape. Of course, journal art, journals or many cases are issuing uh, digital object identifiers for those. So in this metadata page at OSTI.gov or DOE pages, uh, we'll show any time a publisher has provided a DOI to the article so you can bounce right out to that article if it's available. It's not always available, but the app, the uh, Accepted manuscript should be. Um, and then with the authors, of course, uh, ORCID ID is kind of the default PID for authors. So we'll definitely pull in uh, the metadata related to an author's ORCID ID, and you can go out and see their full range of publications. But then I really want to focus on sort of that data set and software output. We've had a service for some time of issuing uh, PIDs or DOIs to data sets and software. So, you, so very seamlessly and it promotes reproducibility to get to that data set and software. So from our metadata page from the journal article or accepted manuscript, you're able to bounce right out to the data set and see that uh, what's happening. And similarly for the software, uh, you can go out and see the software. And, and that really, again, promotes this idea of trans transparency and reproducibility. So that's ultimately what we're trying to get to in implementing the, the policy and the and what's expected from OSTP to fully realize the benefits of open science. And so with that, I just want to say thank you again. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to working with the panel. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. I appreciated those uh, examples right at the end. That was really inspiring. 
Um, and we will be saving questions for the panel time. So I would like to jump into our next speaker now, uh, who is actually joining us remotely from the United Kingdom. Um, this is Emma Wilson. Um, Emma is the Director of Publishing at the Royal Society of Chemistry, and she has strategic responsibility for RSC's portfolio of journals, books, and chemistry databases, ensuring that the publishing portfolio delivers against the Society's mission to help the chemical sciences community make the world uh, a better place. And I can see Emma on the monitor there, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> a particular focus is working with the chemistry community and other stakeholders to accelerate the transition to open access publishing models and supporting the development and adoption of open science practices. She's previously served on both the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association and the Association of Learned and um, Professional Scholarly Publisher Boards. And prior to joining RSC, she held a variety of editorial and business development roles at Elsevier, and before that, trained and worked as a biochemist at the University, Sheffield University, Cambridge, and the University of Rome. Thanks so much, Emma, for joining us remotely. Look forward Great. to talking. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can Can everyone hear me? Uh, okay. I will just uh, share my um, share my screen. We can hear you. Great. Brilliant. Thank you. Right, I'm just sorry. I'll just get this. Up. Screen is shared. Might want to right, get go to the right place. The right presentation. Does that work? Perfect. Brilliant. Okay. So good morning, everyone. And it's an absolute uh, pleasure uh, to be joining you today. I am sorry that I'm not being able to come um, in person. And huge thanks to the organisers uh, for providing me with this um, opportunity. Really looking forward uh, to participating uh, and also learning a lot um, from the panel uh, discussion and workshop. Um, I'm going to take quite a broad view of some of the work that the RSC is doing around um, partnering with researchers and also library uh, communities in our kind of collective road uh, towards open science. Um, and first of all, I'll, I'll put some of that in context of the wider RSC's uh, work. Hopefully we don't need uh, too much of an introduction for this audience, and I'm sure many of you are involved directly in the kind of breadth of our activities, whether that's, um, you know, our educational work, policy work, um, uh, scientific events, working uh, through our membership groups. We have 55,000 uh, members uh, worldwide or through our publications. But everything that we do is uh, focused to deliver our purpose, which is to help the chemical sciences community make the world a better place. And part of our mission is to provide the tools for our community to create and exchange knowledge. This, of course, speaks to open science um, and also our publication portfolio as well. So we publish chemistry databases, we publish books, and we publish a portfolio of uh, 56 uh, journals that span the whole of the chemical sciences. And we're publishing at scale around uh, 36,000 uh, articles a year. So what are we doing uh, around open science? So open science, as, as we've heard, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's really broad and it touches many things, but it's about making every part of the research cycle, not just uh, um, the research outputs, but every part of the research cycle more accessible uh, to all. It's to increase the dissemination of the research, allow its uh, reuse, um, to increase the rigor of research in terms of reproducibility and evaluation, about fostering collaborations um, and also building equity and maximizing the impact of that research also for societal uh, benefit. Um, but this does necessitate a change in the way that science is both conducted and communicated. And so any transition to more open science uh, practices also uh, necessitates a change in open uh, in uh, uh, research culture uh, as well. So I do think um, broadly that uh, societies have a, a really important role that we can play um, here in terms of facilitating the uh, development and the adoption of open science practices. Um, this is because I think we're really quite uniquely placed to work with our communities and our communities are discipline 
um, specific. And I think that's important for open science because there will be different needs uh, within different uh, disciplines. We're also really well placed um, to work across many different aspects of research culture um, and also open science, be that in our accreditation, our um, skills and training programs, um, our, our work ar around uh, research assessment, or whether that's uh, through our publication uh, routes as well. We can partner in this space, and I think a really fantastic example um, of that uh, is around uh, it, it is the formation of Chem Archive, which is when five uh, chemistry societies uh, came together to address a discipline-specific need, uh, open, uh, open science service of the preprint server uh, in chemistry. The other thing that I think is relevant here is where uh, societies are absolutely hardwired to uphold quality and integrity. And although business models may change, um, I don't think this uh, this will. This will always uh, be at the centre of what societies do and how they uphold um, research and the outputs of that research. So as we said, open science is extremely broad. Um, so at the RSC, we think, OK, what does this mean uh, for the chemical sciences and where can we make uh, the most impact? So we focus pre predominantly on research assessment and research culture. And we have broad, broad um, programmes around that and then open, um, open access, which is what I'll talk about now, and then finish quickly on open research data um, as well. So I've been asked to give a little bit of a European uh, perspective as well around open access. So um, open access, the shift to open access is really in full flow, but it isn't uh, evenly uh, distributed yet. However, I think the uh, direction of travel is fairly, uh, fairly clear and it's no longer an if, there'll be open access, it's when, and very importantly, how. So how will that transaction be managed in a fair and equitable um, and sustainable uh, way as well? How would those quality standards be upheld um, uh, as well? So in terms of the push for open access, a European perspective, there are a number of things um, that have happened uh, in Europe. Uh, so we've worked under an open access policy environment um, for some time, uh, and this really culminated in 2018 with the formation of Coalition S, which was a group of funders that came together um, and put forward uh, Plan S. So there are significant open access mandates uh, from funders up operating uh, in Europe. But also, I think really importantly, was the way that um, librarians have really experimented and championed open access uh, models as well and worked with publishers and developed new and innovative, innovative open access models. And you can see this in terms of the um, rise of transformative agreements. And these are sometimes called read and publish agreements or publish and read agreements. And this is when a publisher um, and uh, an institute uh, have an agreement and, we, and within one agreement, there, is, uh, there are fees that cover the open access uh, publishing costs in gold open access journals, um, usually in the, the hybrid portfolio, and there's also a fee um, for any paywalled content, so subscription content as well. It's a way of moving um, and transitioning subscription spend uh, to open access um, services uh, spend as well. So we've been um, experimenting uh, and uh, with these sort of open access agreements uh, since 2016. Um, and as I said on my previous slide, you can see there's been a really significant rise in the last few years of these agreements. We have over 1,250 institutes are covered uh, in 37 countries with really high uptake um, and traction in Europe. But now we're seeing that uh, gaining traction um, in, the, in the US uh, and other uh, countries uh, as well. 
So the routes to open access at the RSC, um, we have a number of them. We have Chemical Sciences, which is our flagship journal, free to read, free to publish, and the costs are covered by the society. We have a portfolio of um, gold open access journals. These are mostly uh, covered by uh, author facing article uh, APC uh, charges. Our portfolio of hybrid journals, um, where authors can choose to publish either by the um, uh, behind the paywall or through a gold open access route. And as I said, we have a growing number of um, institutional open access agreements that support um, the payment uh, that support um, uh, open access uh, publishing, mostly in our hybrid uh, portfolio. And these are extremely uh, popular agreements with researchers, as there's no author facing uh, APC charges when they publish open access if they're covered by an agreement. And we also have uh, Chem Archive, the preprint server, um, uh, uh, which, as I said, is a, um, uh, a shared service uh, formed uh, by five uh, societies. We also have a green route um, to open access publishing as well, and that's uh, with a 12 month embargo period. So how does our community choose to publish? And as you can see, um, we have very high uptake of gold open access publishing uh, for Sweden, uh, for, for countries that are covered by transformative uh, 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 agreements. And as you can see here in the UK, it's over 90, uh, 90 um, in, uh, in Germany, it's, it's uh, somewhat light, lower at 61%, the US 36%, uh, percent, and our UK, our US authors tend to publish uh, open access in our gold uh, open access journals, not our, port, our hybrid portfolio. And China, I've also put up here as well, and China, our Chinese authors, again, uh, favour our gold open access journals and not our hybrid portfolio. Of course, um, we will obviously also be having authors that are publishing under uh, the green route as well. So we've come a long way in terms of open access around um, just under 30 percent of our content is published through a gold open access route. Um, but we believe there is uh, further uh, to go. We see open access as the future and we want to be part of that. We want to be working um, both with our researcher community uh, and also a librarian community to um, develop models uh, that will work for all actors uh, in this uh, in this space. Um, from our perspective, uh, we would like to uh, develop models where authors are not paying for APC um, uh, APCs and paying uh, for open access, but that libraries, um, governments, university um, uh, budgets, uh, governments and funders are reinvest reinvesting the subscription funds uh, to cover open access um, publication uh, costs. And really to have a global understanding where open access, um, and certainly open access at the RSC, is about quality, integrity, as well as transparency. And that quality and integrity part will always be an important part of our um, uh, uh, journal uh, portfolio. So I'm delighted to tell you this is breaking news that we have um, been working um, with customers to develop uh, new and sort of more future uh, facing open access uh, models. So this one um, we co-developed um, with TIB and it's a, a German consortia. It's quite a new way of, of, of looking at institutional models and it has a community action approach uh, as part of it. There are three components to the agreement, uh, a base fee, um, which is a, a membership fee that all members of the consortia pay, uh, and this covers uh, publishing uh, services. There is a publishing component that is variable, and this applies only to institutes that publish. And part of the, um, the way the model works is there is a range of institutes within the consortia. So some research intensive institutes um, that have high publication output, but also um, institutes that have much lower uh, publication output or, or are read only. And that publishing component is not article specific or APC based. And we look at total output of the group and calculate uh, the publishing uh, share uh, accordingly. And there are discounts available as well. So the more institutes um, that uh, participate, the better uh, the rate. 
And um, we believe, and, and I think our, uh, uh, our customers believe that this is a more fair and equitable um, way to structure uh, the fees uh, for these sorts of uh, models. So finally, I'm just going to talk very briefly about uh, open uh, data. Um, although I would uh, shout out, you know, we'd love to talk to um, uh, uh, the librarian community in the US um, in terms of your needs uh, and, uh, and aspirations for open access and to work with you in developing uh, models that will uh, work, uh, work in your circumstances as well. So open data, um, very much believe in the uh, FAIR um, principles uh, for open uh, data. Um, and uh, but there are challenges in the chemical sciences. So from transitioning from supporting information to real data deposition, publication and citation around standards and instrumentation and infrastructure, and also making it easy and rewarding for the researcher. So putting the researcher at the heart of this uh, as well. There's a huge amount going on in the space, and I know many of you um, that are in the room or on, on this call are involved in aspects of this as well. Um, in terms of our journals and linking data sharing to research um, to our article publications, we strongly encourage authors to deposit the data and that's in an appropriate repository and then to formally cite that. And um, as Brian was saying, also had to have a persistent identifier um, there. We encourage uh, data availability statements and we require them on our journal uh, digital uh, discovery. We're working actively with the community around the development of open standards. Uh, we develop open ontologies and are a founding member of the INCHI Trust, for example. And this is a whole community and cross-disciplinary journey that we are on uh, together. Um, so here is a, a just a recap. Follow uh, FAIR guidance, deposit the data when possible. All of the data um, obviously must be shared at submission that supports the finding repositories over supplementary uh, material and look out for journal specific guidelines. And as I said, digital discovery uh, data accessibility statement is required. Strongly encourage authors to deposit as much data and code as possible. And there are um, uh, there is a specific data uh, reviewer on every paper um, that's reviewed uh, for digital uh, discovery who checks the data code, uh, the usability, um, the accessibility of that data, its cleaning, um, the model uh, development and validation and reproducibility, for example, of the code. So I appreciate that was really uh, very much a whistle -top stop uh, tour uh, of some of the things that we're doing at the RSC to support um, and develop open access uh, practices and open science practices more broadly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you for bringing in some of the perspective from uh, from Europe. It's really quite interesting to hear how, uh, how it's, it's uh, unpacking there. Um, next, we'll be having um, a representative of the American Chemical Society. So looking at a, a chemical society publisher in the US. Um, I'm happy to welcome Sarah Teagan, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Publishing Officer for the American Chemical Society Publications. Um, she leads the development of ACS's preeminent portfolio of 85 hybrid and open access journals, oversees the award-winning news magazine, Chemical and Engineering News, and manages the development of the ACS Books Program, and also had strategic planning and relation development in Asia. Dr. Teagan serves as chair of the STM Association, STM's Research Integrity Governance Board, the American Heart Association Scientific Publishing Committee, and the American Society for Microbiology's Publishing Committee. I needed to practice this ahead. <laughs> Sarah previously served as co-chair of STM Society Day, co-chair of SPSP. What does PSP stand for? Sarah, you'll have to tell us when you come up. Journals Committee and the CSE president. Tegan has developed several prose award winning journals and platforms, is a frequent speaker at a range of industry topics, and is alumna of the University of California, Berkeley, and the MIT. Thank you, Sarah, so much. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Leah, for that uh, that introduction. Um, PSP is the Professional and Scholarly Publishers Division of the American 
of the Association of American Publishers. Um, so I've been involved in the industry for a long time. I've been with ACS for about 18 years. And before that, I got my start in publishing at, um, at PNAS, right? So very much steeped in nonprofit publishing, um, society publishing, and the importance that that plays uh, in our ecosystem. Um, really, I want to thank Linda for all of her work in organizing, Rob Leska for his work in, in helping chair. Um, it's a really great opportunity to be here to speak to a lot of like-minded individuals. And I'm really glad to have followed my, my friend and, and colleague, Emma Wilson, um, because RSC and ACS are so very closely aligned in what we do. Um, and, you know, frankly, I could say pretty much ditto to, to Emma's uh, presentation and sit down. Um, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of a tour about what ACS is doing around open access and open science. So, I want to start with a little bit of context setting. I want to talk a little bit about global scholarship. Um, the graph shown here shows the past 20 years of chemistry content, of chemistry articles, as indexed by Scopus. Um, and I sourced this information from the US National Science Foundation and their National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. What we see from the graph here is that chemistry articles, um, as classified by Scopus, are growing at about 5% per year. And nearly all of that growth is happening outside of the US and Europe. And in 2022, uh, the year for which data is most recently available, more than a third of the content came from labs in China. And for me, this is such an interesting shift in the research ecosystem in not such a long time. And it gets at some of what Emma was saying too about the transition to open access and how much more supportive of open access the Europe and the US are. So we're gonna be living in a mixed economy, I think for some time. The second point about growth in scholarship is about the growth in global research and development. In 2000, there was about $750 billion in R&D funding with the US leading the way. Closer to today, uh, the most recent data available was 2019, China is close to investing a trillion US dollars in R&D. That represents for them a five-fold increase in the amount of research and development activity going on there. And the US and Europe are growing, but are growing at a slower pace. We have also understood from some of our partnerships in China and some of the, the, the folks that we know there is that China is looking to shift some of its research and development investment from applied science to more basic research. And they're hoping to grow that fraction of research and development money from 6% to 8%. So why is this important? Right? Global scholarship is growing. As a science enthusiast and a former practitioner, I love this. I think that the world is better when more science is done by more people. However, as a consumer of scientific information, I'm worried that there is so much more good science out there to understand, and somehow my day hasn't gotten longer, right? So it's the problem of trying to figure out how do we shift, sift through all of the information that's out there. So at ACS Publications, like so many other not-for-profit society publishers, we understand that we play a really vital role in the research community. We are the community, right? Folks who are chemists join the American Chemical Society, join the Royal Society of Chemistry, join the German Chemical Society. They are our scholarly homes. Um, we set the standards, we convene people, we recognize practitioners, we educate uh, the practitioners. Um, we as nonprofits also reinvest any excess revenue back into the things that the society does. And that's a really important difference for Emma and me from some of the other commercial publishers out there. Like Emma said, one of the things we care most, post, most uh, closely about within the ACS publications is research integrity. It's not lip service for me, it's not lip service for my colleagues to that when we say we want to strive to be the most trusted source of chemical information, we mean that. We live that every day because we, because without trust in science, um, without trust in what we do, uh, misinformation flourishes. And I think that diminishes the importance of science globally. And we are living in an age of misinformation. And the more that we can do to help promote trusted research, I think the better off we are as, as a global uh, population. 
So at ACS Publications, our 900 editors are all active practitioners of chemistry. They are professors, they are government researchers, they are corporate scientists, and they work closely with our professional staff, many of whom are trained in chemistry or other scientific disciplines. We have a team of people who are responsible for helping to educate our editors on best practices in peer review and how to manage their own work. We also have two groups within our publishing integrity office who focus solely on ethics and data. These folks work closely with our editors and our authors to uphold and understand research integrity. In addition to that, we are active members and participants and leaders within things like the Committee on Publication Ethics, or the STM Research Integrity Hub, um, the Research Data Alliance, and we've endorsed, endorsed the Joint Declaration of Data Citation Principles. Um, so research integrity really is at the heart of everything that we do. I wanna turn next into diving into research data sharing and I want to reiterate here that we are committed to the FAIR principles for sharing. All of ACS journals have embraced a level one uh, of the, the FAIR data principles, means that all of our authors are encouraged, encouraged to share data. Some of our journals now require a data availability statement that's primarily in our, in our organic chemistry journals, um, and we're using them as a, as a pilot test case. Um, and what we're learning from the pilot is going to extend into what we are planning to do for all of our journals, where we'll require a data availability statement for every single publication. And then finally, some of our journals have adopted a level three plan where some data must be shared, and this is a little bit discipline specific thing things like um, sharing uh, CCDC coordinates and things like that. So within the context of data sharing, we also realize that there is a role for ACS to play in helping to facilitate the deposition, storage, and retrieval of data in a way that also helps get authors credit for helping the scholarly community. I'm really glad to have heard that uh, from, from Brian, right, that sharing data, that sharing publications helps not just academic researchers, scholarly researchers, but it helps the, the, um, the, the small business community get access to information. We think that that's really important, but we also want to make sure that authors, that researchers are getting credit for the work that they're, um, they're doing to make their data available. So along those lines, we are developing the Chemistry Data Bank as the site to deposit digital data relevant to chemistry. Um, chemistry Data Bank will bridge the two-sided market in scientific research. Uh, it will provide clear guidance to authors on how to apply open science standards to their chemistry research to enable them to share their primary research data. Right, The thing that we know is we want researchers to to do the things that they're really good at, to do the things that they want to do. We want them back in the lab. We don't want to have them thinking about how do I administer all of the, the, the requirements around the funding and, and research. We want them to do research. On the other side of the equation, Chemistry Data Bank will deliver high quality, practical primary research data sets to chemistry researchers as part of the supporting information in published journal articles. And for us, this means that they're gonna have a DOI as well. So getting at that requirement for uh, persistent identifiers, we fully agree that the infrastructure of, of publishing, DOIs, PIDs, ORCIDs, all of which have been funded by the publishing industry are important components for findability, accessibility, reusability. And ACS Publications has been a supporter of open access now for nearly two decades. Um, but uh, it was about 19 years ago that we made our first articles openly available. And in order to stimulate researchers to publish open access, a decade ago in 2014, we created a program that allowed authors to use an ACS provided token to publish their next article in ACS open access. We introduced an ACS sponsored diamond open access journal, ACS Central Science, um, totally sponsored by, by the American Chemical Society and ACS Central Science is led by 2022 Nobel Prize laureate, Carolyn Bertozzi, and it focuses on interdisciplinary research of exceptional quality. We also want ACS publications to be accessible for all different kinds of researchers. So around the same time that we introduced ACS Central Science, we also created our sound science journal, ACS Omega. 
And in 2021, we introduced our gold suite of open access journals, which satisfy, sat, satisfy the needs of authors who are required to publish in fully open access journals, but who are seeking a venue that's more closely tied to the disciplinary community to which they are affiliated. So for ACS today, we have 17 fully open access journals, um, as well as 70 hybrid, open, uh, hybrid journals. I really couldn't be more proud of our journals program. Um, with the exception of central science that ACS funds, our open access journals are supported by transformational agreements or by article publishing fees um, with various and substantial uh, discounts available to subscribers at various institutions um, around the world. Um, I also want to reinforce what Miriam said before. I really appreciated her comment that open science is careful science. I couldn't agree more. And each of our open access journals is guided by the same rigorous peer review process as any other ACS journal. And the editors of our open access journals have the same goals as every other ACS editor, to work with their communities, to work with authors, to shape and publish the best science for the community that the journal serves. Our efforts to help the community navigate the transition to open access are working. In the past three years, our open access authorship has increased by 40%. Our open access articles have increased by 50%. And the usage of our open access articles has grown by 64%. Um, that number of published papers in 2023, more than 15,700 open access articles, represents about 25% of our portfolio. And we are committed to moving with the market. And I think it's really great to see that RSC and ACS are just about on par with the number or with the percentage of, of papers that are published open access. Our sales team has worked really closely with the chemistry librarian community to develop read and publish agreements that, uh, like Emma talked about earlier. Um, and as we closed out last year, we have more than a thousand read and publish agreements across 35 countries. Um, the one thing that doesn't get highlighted in this graphic is a really great program, an innovative program that we created that's aimed at creating more equity in the system. For primarily undergraduate institutions who are subscribers to ACS publications, their researchers who choose to submit to our journals are offered an open access option with ACS covering all of the costs. So no cost to the researchers um, at these primarily undergraduate institutions. And last year, more than 100 papers were made open access through this program. I think that's a great way that we are getting at equity within the system. ACS Publications wants to support all authors who wish to publish in our journals. And I'm really glad that funders, institutions, and publishers agree that there is a real cost to the scholarly publishing. To ensure a sustainable model of delivering high quality, rigorous services from submission to final editorial decision, last fall, we introduced a new option for authors who need to utilize a zero embargo green open access option because of a funder mandate. We call this option the Article Development Charger ADC. The ADC simply covers the cost of ACS's publishing services through the final editorial decision. This includes organizing and developing and maintaining the high quality scholarly review process that's provided by our global network of fantastic editors and reviewers. It includes our focus on research integrity that I mentioned earlier. It includes all of the infrastructure that goes along with publishing. It also includes community development activities, which are so important to scholarly societies. So in the six months or so since we introduced uh, this, this new program, we've had some questions about who this uh, option will apply to. The answer today is that it applies to a very, very small number of authors. More than 90% of authors who are subject to these mandates have a simple and funded pathway to make their articles gold open access in ACS journals, either through uh, institutional read and publish agreements um, or another source of funding. The ADC is intended to provide a solution to that small fraction of remaining authors who need to adhere to the zero embargo green open access mandate. And today, uh, as of earlier this week, we have had only one author utilize this pathway. Like so many other organizations, um, 
so many other funding bodies, so many other coalitions, our preferred option is for authors to utilize read and publish agreements to make their uh, version of record open access through a gold pathway, right? And we couldn't agree more with Emma that we don't want authors paying directly open access fees. We would much rather work with funders, with institutions, with governments to find a way that makes this sustainable for everyone. And the final thing that I want to talk on uh, that that uh, Emma also talked about is uh, a way to broaden access to research results is the collaboration that Chem Archive embodies through five like-minded scholarly chemistry societies. Um, in 2017, we created Chem Archive jointly, which is the preprint server dedicated to chemistry. It's funded and run by us as part of our service to the to the development of the chemistry community. Um, and I am so pleased that Chem Archive covers so many different disciplines of chemistry and receives submissions from around the globe. It continues to grow really nicely with more than 21,000 preprints uh, posted last year. And those preprints were viewed nearly 50 million times, which speaks to the power of preprinting in chemistry. Chem Archive, just to reiterate, is free to authors and readers and with the costs for Chem Archive borne by the five partner societies. So just to close out, scholarly societies play a unique and critical role within the publishing ecosystem. Our goals are quite different from commercial publishers. We reinvest in our community. We help set the discipline norms. We educate the next generation. We convene the community. And we are thoroughly committed to protecting the integrity of the literature. Um, we want to educate uh, on great research practice, including sharing, and our community expects no less of us. They expect us to take a leadership role here. Um, I hope that we can agree that scholarly publishing is more robust when you have many different kinds of publishers who are represented in it. And I will be happy to take questions with the panel a little later. Thanks. Thank Much, Sarah, for that background on ACS programs, and I look forward to following up further during the Q&A with some of those. Um, last but not least, we have a, we'll have a librarian perspective. Libraries have been mentioned several times over the course of the day already, so it's really my great pleasure to welcome uh, Elaine Westbrooks. Um, Elaine is the university librarian. Um, see, um, where is your title on here? Here we go. <laughs> Sorry, Elaine. <laughs> Carly Kroc, University Librarian and Vice Provost at Cornell University. Um, caveat, I did invite her, but I wasn't going to be leading this panel originally. So uh, Elaine has received her um, bachelor's degree from the University of Pittsburgh and her master's degree in library and information science, also from Pittsburgh. Um, she first came to Cornell Library in 2000 as a metadata librarian. Um, and then in 2005, she became a senior metadata librarian and then was uh, uh, became the head of metadata services. Um, she developed and strengthened strategic alliance with other library units um, to really advance and position metadata services as an integral component um, of libraries' digital collections. Um, in 2008, she became the Associate Dean for Library Operations at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, uh, where she provided strategic managerial staff development operational leadership for technical services, research and instruction services, all branch libraries, and the data curation program. Uh, in 2012, uh, uh, excuse me, Elaine, <laughs> um, became the Associate University Librarian for Research at the University of Michigan, where she coordinated and administered support for the university's research enterprise, um, also providing operational leadership to the Copyright, Copyright Office, Asia Library, Area Studies, and most of the subject specialists. And then from 2017 to 2022, Elaine served as a university librarian and vice provost for university libraries at the no University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, where she was responsible for the library annual budget of $45 million. Um, as an expert who's been interviewed by the Chronicle of Higher Education in Vox, uh, Elaine has also co-authored Metadata in Practice with Diane Hillman in 2004 and co-edited the ed Academic Library Management Case Studies um, with Tammy nicholson Deary and Michael Meth in 2017. So she's a much sought out speaker on diversity, equity, inclusion in libraries and other topics related to scholarly communications and leadership. Um, in 2015 and 2016, she was uh, honored with the Foreign Expert Award by Fudan University in Shanghai 
um, for her her leadership in building strategic partners across borders. Um, she serves on the board of numerous um, organizations, including Sage Publishing, Center for Open Science, and the Digital Public Library of America. So thank you, Elaine. All right, thank you, Leah, for that introduction. It is um, really an honor to be here, and I very much appreciate the um, opportunity to talk and to meet many of you. Um, so I'm going to jump right in here. And um, I wanted to just come out with an affirmative <laughs> statement on where I believe the scholarly communication system is currently right now. And so, as you may know, we're now as an Ivy League school and we're part of the Ivy Plus Library Confederation. And we collectively spend 200 million a year on collections. And um, yet when we meet face-to-face -face and via Zoom, we lament on how difficult it is to acquire the research that is necessary to support the research, teaching, learning, and healing that's happening at these institutions. And so, um, so I titled this presentation though about facilitators and funders because I always have to remind a lot of people that libraries are the source of a lot of the funding that we that is necessary to support the research. Um, that is taking place, right? Whether you're, it's the society, the society's publishing is being funded by the library. If it's, you know, uh, one of the big multinational publishers, that funding is coming from the library. And um, in addition to that, it's all the services that we provide of the librarians that are supporting this work that is also being funded by the library. And I think that is a really important point. And as things change and as memberships drop in societies and and um, and the budgets get tighter, there's still um, this really important role that we pay we play as the funder and as a facilitator. Um, and so I'll talk more about some of these issues that are really hitting higher ed just to provide more context. But I did want to start off with this because I do um, firmly believe that uh, we still are not out of the woods, right? We still have a, a system that is um, quite challenging. And, um, and I think it's gonna be difficult to get to open science if we don't address some of these issues with our scholarly communication system. And, um, and I believe that you, know, you still have to be at elite, elite institutions um, and have elite libraries that, to fully participate in uh, many of these publishing uh, models that we have. Um, I believe that the population of people conducting the research lacks diversity. The people who get to publish um, is not a diverse group and the people to decide who gets to publish is not exactly a diverse group. And I think there's still a lot of barriers that are in place that make it difficult for many people to participate. And then fundamentally, I believe many of this is still remains unaffordable. And you can be a nonprofit publisher and still be unaffordable. Um, so it's not just for saying, oh, only one group is unaffordable. There's a lot of unaffordable um, uh, research that libraries are not able to acquire. Okay, and so I wanted to provide some context about the higher ed because um, this is interesting. There we go. Um, because of course, the research enterprise is so important um, to an institution like Cornell University. Um, but there's so many other things that are going on in higher ed. And I would just start off by saying that values that have been core to Cornell University since its founding have become hot, hotly debated topics nationwide. And so higher ed is really in a moment where, you know, free expression, First Amendment is extremely challenging on campuses today. Academic freedom, intellectual freedom. Um, we have a, a community, particularly in the United States, is questioning the value of a college education. Um, we have pressures from government and donors who, who want to decide who gets to be hired and fired at universities. We have, um, you know, a de declining investment 
in higher ed in general. Um, we have legacy admissions that are being heavily scrutinized right now. Affirmative action in um, higher ed and um, admissions is now illegal. We have artificial intelligence as a major disruptor. Um, and it's and we're in a world that's increasingly dictated by algorithms. And AI is not merely a technological phenomenon. It is a transformative force that is redefining our intellectual, social, and professional landscapes. Um, we have uh, historic censorship, the battle for privacy, and a reckoning, right? We have at least 40 bills introduced in 22 states um, that are essentially um, trying to um, restrict diversity, equity, inclusion efforts in higher ed. And uh, finally, and I can go on, but we have a, a increasing unioniza unionization of student athletes and graduate students that is um, certainly um, taking hold throughout higher ed. So this is kind of the, <laughs> the complex situation that we find higher ed in addition to um, thinking about the research enterprise and how we go change the world and push the frontiers of knowledge um, at these institutions. And so one of the things I hear a lot about is um, a lot of hand wringing and moaning about compliance, right? That just happens a lot. Um, and I think that um, this idea that, you know, there's always something else to comply with and <laughs> something that our researchers, and I talk to faculty every day, and this is, you know, this is something that just keeps coming up. And, you know, I, I typically say, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel your pain, but you still have to do this, right? And I think part of it is, it's not just the research compliance, but it's the compliance for um, all the other things. So um, harassment and sexual assault and athletics, admissions, academic integrity, um, all these things that these significant risks that the universities are subjected to. And so the compliance, I think is really important. Like we have to have these sticks um, because I don't think actually higher ed is going to change without some of the, these sticks. And I wish they were more carrots, but these sticks are really important to really um, force the change that we think is, is necessary. So the other part I wanted to make is um, awareness about a lot of these issues that have been talked about today, awareness about um, scholarly communications. And so just this morning, I got an email from a faculty member um, asking me about retractions and why are there so many retractions and why, you know, and these, I did not used to get these questions before. And then yesterday I got an article or an email from a, a faculty member who wants to talk about flipping their journal, right? And so what I would say that there are these multiple stages of awareness. And I would say that when I first came into the profession, even though Paul Ginsberg had started the, the archive at Los Alamos in 1991, brought it to Cornell, um, there still weren't a lot of conversations about the system and, and what's working, what's not working. And so I think there were, was a lot of unawareness. And now I'm seeing a lot more problem aware, right? They know there's a problem, but they're not exactly how, they, they, they don't know how to um, solve the problem. And, and now I get this question of like, how can we help solve this problem? And so I think these stages of awareness, like I've witnessed it in my 30 years in this profession to see that people are thinking about these things um, much more. People are, are very concerned. And of course, librarians have been concerned for a really long time. Um, but to hear a lot more questions, a lot more concern from the faculty is something that is just is definitely changing and it's increasing. And so in terms of the, the context of the library, so you have higher ed, all the pressures of higher ed, then you have the research libraries and all the pressures that, um, uh, that keep me up at night and I think about day in and day out. And um, I would say first and foremost is really about the chokehold on the library budgets, right? And so, you know, my budget for um, materials, almost 85% of it is already um, sucked up by about, you know, three publishers, essentially. So, so the serials, scientific serials are dominating the budget. And 
that number was not the case before, right? It was closer to 50% than 60, but now it's it's in the 80s. And so I have very few degrees of freedom to go out and acquire the content that um, that the researchers would like to have at Cornell University. And so in that what's left, I have to pay for the monographs and databases and maps and all those other things, all the data sets and things that um, are needed for research, teaching, learning, and healing. Um, and of course, Cornell University uh, keeps bringing in new programs, right? New departments, new areas of um, disciplines are splitting. There's, these things keep happening. Obviously, new journals keep getting produced. Um, a lot of journals are publishing more issues per volume. And, and so being able to keep up with the velocity, the, the, the volume, the variety of, of scholarly um, research and the assets are being, being produced as a result of this is very difficult with a flat budget, right? And so it's a very difficult conversation because I often get called. And so they'll talk to, you know, my wonderful librarians like Leah and say, hey, I'm upset. Like, why'd you cancel this journal and all this stuff? And, you know, I didn't have to say this before, but now it's just like, okay, well, what, what other journal should we cancel so we keep the journal that you want? And that's not the kind of conversation I want to have with the researchers, but that's the one I have on a regular basis because um, our, we're so constrained with the budgets that it's either, you, if you add one journal, you have to subtract another. So this is the reality of um, the research library budget. And, I, and if this can happen at an Ivy League school like Cornell, you can imagine that's what's happening at some of the other schools um, that have, um, you know, that are very um, prestigious schools, schools that are putting out amazing um, research like Michigan State and Michigan and, and Berkeley, but these pressures are real. And so I want to show this picture because, um, you know, for many years, this, this whole scholarly communications thing just kept me up at night. And now I guess I've come to accept that, you know, the budget's flat, you know, at some point this is gonna take care of itself because I only have so much money. And the buying power keeps going down significantly year after year. I could just buy less, right? And so I, I want to then start this picture because, um, you know, I want to remind our um, listeners that libraries' jobs are to pr preserve the scholarly record. And so this is a picture from our annex. And my job is to preserve and steward what we have purchased for the past 200 years forever. And so this annex is just as important to me as the journals that I subscribe to um, every day. And this is what's keeping me up at night more <laughs> because nobody has enough space for this stuff. And of course, there's a lot of this is monographs and, and archives and things like that. But this is really important that we preserve this for future generations of scholars, not just Cornellians, but everyone. We want to preserve this. And this is, um, you know, thinking about how do we keep this at, um, you know, I think we have, uh, gosh, seven, no, I'm sorry, we 55 degrees, 36% relative humidity. The cost of that, the cost of moving the materials, what if I have to build another one of these, is, which is what I'm comp contemplating now. And so, this preservation mandate, the curation and stewardship is so important. And as we shift our models, we're not thinking about acquiring the content anymore like we used to. And now it's been about how do we acquire access? And so I think what also is important is that, and this goes to the preservation, is these are our values, right? And it's really important that we have these values to be the backbone to our policies um, their promises for what libraries stand for. And these values guide our decision making, particularly when our resources are constrained. And so they demonstrate what is important to us and they send a message to everyone what we value. Um, and what's in, what it sends a message to publishers, our donors, our administrators, our, st um, our staff. And they allow us to make mid course corrections if we stray. So these are the eight values that I think are really important as we think about this future of. Um, building collections. And so the shift I see happening um, among the research libraries 
is just rethinking how we build research collections. And, and of course, we've already given up. We can't buy everything. Um, but interlibrary loan is awesome. And we will continue to invest in interlibrary loan. And what I've learned is um, at other institutions where I've canceled titles, uh, interlibrary loan picks up the slack very well. And it's a lot cheaper to support interlibrary loan than to buy journals, right? So interlibrary loan is we're going to double down on that. We're also having these bigger conversations about collective collections. And so instead of just thinking about Cornell as a collection, I think of all the other 12 Ivy Plus schools as that collection. The Big Ten does the same. The University of California does the same. And then the other thing I want to mention is controlled digital lending. I mean, it has a long way to go, but we have to find a way to uh, lawfully and legally share digital content. Um, the technology is there. We just have to figure this out. And of course, we have to abide by the laws. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, when we analyze the serial cancellations, we don't see interlibrary loan going through the roof, right? When we make these cancellations, we don't fully understand what our faculty are doing because we cancel, we save the money, but we don't know how they're getting it. Now we can we can uh, suspect that they're using illegal means, they're getting it from friends, like they're doing all kinds of things. But with the data has been very clear that when you cancel things like large sets, thousands of titles, the world does not come to an end. And I think this is the reality that we live in. So uh, I want to mention the open science and I want to go back to, the, to this idea that open access is fundamentally a part of open science. And I don't think you can have one or the other. You have to have both. And so open science is something that is really, really important to libraries. And we are um, very much committed to supporting it in every way possible. And um, I was just thinking about the positions I hire. And so nowadays, you know, we just have a position posted for um, open scholarship librarian, data visualization librarian, data curation librarian. These are the positions that I'm, I'm increasingly hiring because data is so important. And, um, and we have, you know, we're expanding our department for open science and our open scholarship and digital scholarship. And it's like, we never have enough. Like I could, I could hire six more librarians and it's never going to be enough. Um, but facilitating this open science is something that we do. Um, and the policy work that we um, that we participate in. And so um, one of the groups that were, was already mentioned, I think Marian mentioned, is this um, Helios. That's an organization in higher ed that's really thinking about um, the higher ed um, leadership initiative for open scholarship is something we're really supporting right now. But if I go back to one, um, we are continuing to provide some funding, but we're really, um, what's the word? We scrutinize it quite a bit, right? And so we just don't give anybody open access funding, but we really think about what kind of publishing we want to support. And then, um, as I mentioned, policy change is really important that we're working internally with our institution, but also externally. We're really big on author rights. And we spent a lot of time educating our authors about how to make good choices. And this, this whole education component is really important to us. So, um, and then finally, our values remain really important and are driving what we do more and more every day. And, and so I do feel like we are setting up a situation where, you know, we have our values and we make sure that our researchers and faculty understand those values. And so when they're upset, when we cancel the journals because they don't align up for, with our values, that they don't, you know, they don't beat me up, right? <laughs> that they, they go back to the society or the publisher or whatever and have that conversation because we're at the point where this is not a sustainable system and the values are what we have to stand on no matter what. And, um, and this, is, this is a lot of the conversation that's happening, not only at Cornell, but in libraries, research libraries across the country. So I think I will, um, oh, I forgot to mention, um, just the consortia that we're working on are doing so much. This is what we talk about. This is what we talk about in the association research library meetings. Um, they're all the Northeast Research Library Group. These buying clubs are still important. They're still relevant to us. Helios, as I already mentioned, is working on the policy and working across many institutions. 
And then we really want to invest in like-minded institutions. So thinking about ORCID and data site and RDA and all these, there's so many groups that are working on these issues. And so we are really trying to invest in all of those groups and, and be clear on what we want to invest in and what we don't want to invest in. So I think that is actually the end. Thank you. All right, welcome back everybody from the break. Um, welcome to everyone online. We're gonna be moving now into a question answer and also discussion portion of the program. So um, we have about an hour for this session so we can have a lot of time to really dig into some of the, the burning issues you might have around some of these topics. Um, <clears throat> so anyone who's just joining us, we just uh, finished a, a round robin of speakers on a panel. We had funders and publish society pub publishers and librarians represented. Um, so a breadth of perspectives and stakeholders around this question of open access and publishing scientific articles. Okay, so now we will move into the Q&A and I'll, I'll go ahead and kick it off. Um, there's a question that came in through Zoom, but I think we could broaden this um, and, and get it going. Um, you know, we're in a transition period here. We're trying a lot of different models. Um, a lot of it hinges around where the money's coming from, of course, it's one of the bottom lines. Another thing is maybe workflows and infrastructure to support, um, support, support those workflows. What is the vision for the future and getting to a place where um, the workflow, but also the, the accessibility of the funding is equitable um, across, across the community, across the research sectors, across different size institutions, across different areas of the world? So um, this question originally came in for Emma, so we can start there. <laughs> But we'll 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 go around the panel. Go ahead, Emma. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so that's a that's a big question, um, and it it is at, at the nub of 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 lots of things. I mean, in, as I said, I think I think the tra there is a transition, and we won't get. I mean, this is going to be very messy. I think for quite a long uh, time, there is experimentation, and there are different uh, models. I think there is an awareness and a, a greater awareness that um, equity is important and needs to be built in from the the beginning but how that is done on a both a, a kind of on a sort of practical and money flows basis I think is extraordinarily uh, difficult um, and that's why we need as I said we need a lot of discussions we need a lot of quite detailed work to really understand how that how that can work and that should work I mean the question in in the zoom I completely acknowledge you know we are taking small steps here um you, you you know, and we don't have uh, uh, the answers. I, I I think it's going to be a very collaborative uh, effort. Um, we are, you know, working, and you you may be aware there are kind of you know the OASPA has a working group that's looking at this, um, working uh, with researchers and librarians from different places uh, on on the globe. But I don't think there's a magic answer to this. I think there's greater awareness that it needs to be built in and that have one inequitable system for another one. But I don't think, um, uh, it, you know, I, 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 it, it's going to take a, a, a while and be quite, quite iterative. I think I'd be really interested actually on in what other people feel. Um, uh, as I said, from um, the RSP, uh, RSC's perspective, we do see that, you know, it's institutes, funders and governments that, that are, um, uh, are funding the, the cost of open access publishing, we would say not necessarily around an APC or an APC based model. We don't see that as a as a long term sort of end game. Um, but the movement of money and how that money flows is is not straightforward. Thank you for your thoughts on that, Emma. Who would like to jump in next? Everyone has the money issue. Sarah. Yeah, sure. I think that the other consideration here, too, is 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 global. Right. I mean, hmm. data that I showed with third of chemistry content coming out of China now um, is only going to, I think, lengthen that that transition. Right. I mean, um, it, it, th this is a really hard question that we spend a lot of time talking about, and we don't have all of the answers, you know, today for us, you know, transformative agreements uh, make a lot of sense. There are uh, groups that are clearly left out. And, you know, when we 
make programs to enable uh, equity, um, whether it is geographically or kinds of institution based, the funding for that still has to come from some other place. And, you know, heard from Elaine, like, right, your, your funding is tight. And so should you have to help fund that equity? I don't, I don't know. Um, so I think we collectively have to have some better conversations about where this comes from, because I don't want nonprofit societies to go away. The thing that I don't want to happen, right, is a race to the bottom. I, you know, I think that that the 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 focus that we put on research integrity um, is something that we cannot afford to lose. And sometimes those end up being nice to have then if you've got a race towards the bottom. We can't do that. We cannot do that as a community. So I really welcome additional conversations with this group of people and others to say, what's a real solid solution look like for the long term? Thank you, Sarah. Emma, or, uh, Elaine, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that um, this is really difficult. We all acknowledge that. And I think that, um, some of the models and the things that we're trying out are very helpful. And I think that we're going to need a much more radical approach to this problem. And, um, and that's going to be a significant change. And of course, the word radical in higher ed, like there's nothing radical or, you know, you just can't change things really, really quickly in higher ed. So I think that I'm glad that we've tried these new models, and I think we've it's demonstrated clearly some of the problems with this system. And um, we're going to need some bold individuals, some bold publishers, some bold societies to start pushing the envelope and and really trying to um, poke at some of the known problems that we have. I mean, we're just talking peer review is a problem. Um, it was not designed to do the things it's doing now, and um, that worries me, and I think I could go on and on on all the different components of this system that are not holding up very well, and they're being exposed right now. And whether the system we have, whether it's a read and publish or the community models, these all these problems are being exposed. And so we need this collective bold action um, with publishers, libraries, presses. I also run Cornell University Press. So I I understand some of those, the economics on the other side of that too. So we need all these partners working together. Thank you, Elaine. Brian? I have to choose the right speak button here. Um, yeah, just a few different thoughts on it. Uh, for one thing, I, I think there seems to be a consensus that uh, gold open access or you know, some APC uh, based model of, of achieving the public access mandates. It just seems to be the consensus view that that's the only way to achieve this. And uh, I'm sure uh, publishers have looked at, uh, you know, their business models and the revenue models and so forth and made that conclusion. Um, I would, I, I guess I would uh, ask that everyone keep an open mind as to whether that is the de facto solution to things. Um, green open access uh, in terms of DOE's implementation of it has been the primary mechanisms that mechanism that we have done that by. Uh, I know that seems less sustainable in a, in a zero embargo <laughs> environment for the publishers. Um, and, but uh, one question that Bob Hanish asked earlier, you know, what does a media mean in terms of, uh, and that was mostly in the realm of the data side of things. Uh, I think it also applies to the publication side of things. There are um, natural uh, administrative lags in the uh, in the actual um, meeting of immediate uh, access upon publication that are are probably not likely to make it immediately accessible on day one, and uh, and uh, in DOE's own case, <clears throat> uh, some of our labs are taking full advantage of the twelve month embargo to get those public, those accepted manuscripts to us. Others are getting them to us as soon as they can through their own workflow, workflow processes, but that's no sooner typically than two or three months after publication. Uh, so uh, uh, while we're going to strive toward immediate access, I don't know that, that it's going to happen on day one. So I think that that dynamic uh, needs to be factored into uh, publishers' calculus as to, as to uh, whether goal open access is 
the de facto uh, solution for getting there. And um, just as we did with the 12-month uh, embargo, I think uh, publishers are creative in finding <clears throat> a value-added um, role of the version of record that the accepted manuscript did not offer. So I think there, there's some imaginative ways there to uh, still have that wholesome value uh, that don't necessarily force us all to go to gold open access. Um, and then I would uh, uh, close by saying that uh, the uh, article development charge, even though that's expected to be the, uh, the rare exception, um, in, ter in terms of an article, if an author chooses to go to a, uh, a green open access uh, path, um, from a DOE perspective, and this is something we're discussing internally, uh, whether whether that's an allowable cost in terms of in terms of the uh, path to publication, because there's no guarantee you're going to get published uh, through that, uh, and and it could potentially infringe on the government's right to uh, have uh, a license to that copyright. So I'm not sure that's uh, also uh, a sustainable uh, business model to get there. Thanks. Thank you for your comments on that, <clears throat> everyone. Uh, it'll be a long, interesting view forward. Jake, you've been waiting. Thanks. Um, is this working? Okay, great. Um, I, I want to follow up on that, that exact question, but I want to frame it a little bit differently. And what I want to say is that I think that when a lot of people talk about open access, what they say is, oh, you know, I... I want someone who is not a scientist, but you know, let's say their mother has cancer and, and they wanna find a cancer paper that they previously wouldn't have been able to have access to so they can bring it to the doctor and so on and so forth, right? That, that, that's the example that people like to bring up. But I think that this conversation has laid bare a much deeper problem, which is that the current funding model, as we heard so eloquently in Elaine's talk, is not sustainable. And, you know, I worry about that a lot because I work for publisher. And so, you know, when, when you're in a situation where a university like Cornell can barely afford the publication cost, then, you know, it's not simply a question of, you know, do you have a subscription agreement or a read and publish agreement or this agreement or that agreement? The, the question is, you know, at a fundamental level, how are we going to keep this whole enterprise afloat? And one of the questions that I have very specifically about that is, has the open access question started moving in the direction of more of the publishing money coming from the funder rather than from the university? And if we are moving in that direction, then should there be currently a lot more funder publisher discussions than there traditionally have been? because in the, the sort of status quo is that publishers mostly deal with the universities rather than with the funders. We would love to have more conversations with funders. Uh, we don't feel like our voices have been heard um, or well engaged, frankly. Uh, we're certainly open to uh, continuing our dialogues with, with publishers. We have had uh, extensive engagements with the publishers uh, in different forums, and so we're very much open to that. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, you know, the plant in the European uh, Plan S environment, um, I think uh, that whole effort was driven partly by the funders, but also by the library community uh, to solve some of the serials crisis there. And the uh, government's uh, public access uh, objectives were not were not intended to solve the serials crisis. They were intended to solve uh, the public's access to the to the tax to the to the to the, to the taxpayer funded research results. Um, so while it would be nice to uh, solve some of that that serials crisis for uh, the libraries and their and their uh, subscription costs. Um, the ultimate goal is to try to get that research out to the public more quickly. And uh, so uh, finding finding the resources uh, to, to do that, um, <clears throat> there again, I go towards where, you know, I think everyone needs to look for economies to be achieved, savings to be achieved in the system so that uh, it's not a, it's not seen as, a, a, you know, there's this 
there's this level of funding that has to be has to be uh, transferred either the, either from the universities to the funders. And of course, the funders concern is uh, Congress isn't going to throw more money at us because of this. They're going to, you know, here's your research funding and more money is going to be taken away from it for that. Um, so um, I don't know that there's a ready made solution to that. But um, again, I, I would uh, encourage everybody to continue to look for efficiency, efficiencies in the system so that so that this the full brunt of this uh, access isn't uh, put on the publishers uh, because ultimately we're just trying to get to the publisher to the taxpayers that which they've already funded. I just want to add it depends on the discipline. You know, I did a transformative agreement on a with with a social sciences and out of like 65 authors only one had funding. And this is at UNC Chapel Hill, one institution that probably publishes more social sciences than any other institution. Uh, maybe Michigan's the other, and they didn't. So it depends. And I and I I buy for all disciplines, and so the arts and humanities, performance, those areas obviously were, aren't even in this space. But social sciences is you know kind of on the line, and the funding just isn't there. Thank you. If there's any comments in the room on any of these topics, um, yeah, I, feel free to raise your hand. So, yeah, I know there's a Q&A. I just wanted to mention that. No, I, I have a supplementary point to make. Great. Go for it. Okay. I was just going to call on you. <laughs> Jump in the queue. Uh, I'm Stephen Burley. I run the Protein Data Bank, and I'll be speaking this afternoon. Um, I, I, I would be grateful if, as people think about this issue that they should think more broadly about the question of uh, does the cost of preserving the data and publishing the results belong to the funders of the research. I think there are a lot of people in the scientific community who feel that it's the funders' responsibility to ensure that the data are preserved and that the results are made available to the people who, who funded the research, the taxpayers. And within even the NIH, you see differences of opinion among directors as to where that cost should be borne. And there doesn't seem to be a clear, despite what Biden said in 2022, there does not seem to be a clear consensus within among the funders as to how, how best to proceed. So thank you. I'll leave that to my brave friend, uh, Bob Hannish, to talk some about it in the afternoon, uh, because that's on the data side of things. But uh, yeah, I think your point is well taken. Uh, and uh, I think there are um, financial aspects of, of both grants and, and contracts uh, where that'll be addressed and, and, uh, and the permissibility of uh, uh, building those kind of costs into the, into the funding proposals. Uh, and uh, I think there's an expectation that uh, you know that 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 is an allowable cost as part of that. Um, on the uh, publication side of things, uh, again, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, we recognize <coughs> the publishers are moving uh, more aggressively in that direction, and uh, and that those that those uh, the responsibility of agencies to uh, allow for those costs so long as they are reasonable. Uh, uh, is also something that uh, we're expecting to see in the funding proposal. Um, and uh, so so there there will be kind of a shift from uh, uh, those costs being paid uh, 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 more by the fund by the funders and the, and the agencies and in in the effect in in the sense that that's going to uh, lead libraries to decide, okay, more and more of these publications are made immediately accessible. We can we can uh, uh, end our subscriptions. Uh, then that would benefit uh, their budgets. Um, uh, but again, uh, th there could be uh, there could be some alternative models that I don't that I don't know have fully been explored uh, in terms of uh, ways of uh, allowing for the quick public access uh, in a zero embargo environment through the green open access route while still allowing for the publishers to recoup some of those costs uh, in, a, in a value added role of the version of record uh, in uh, through subscriptions. Thank you, Brian. Any other comments from the panel? Okay, Bob, finish. Bob Hanish from NIST and uh, 
I will be much less diplomatic than you, Brian, this afternoon as I address this topic. Um, so I'll, I'll hold those comments until this afternoon. But um, something in one of your slides, Brian, uh, brings up this question, which sort of bridges this discussion and this afternoon's. And, and you had a slide that showed a researcher depositing data in Figshare. And so this raises the question, well, what is the acceptable suite of repositories? How do we decide what criteria are used? And whose responsibility is it? Is it the publisher's responsibility? Is it the uh, university's responsibility, the government agency's responsibility? Um, the SOS, of course, published a, a white paper on desirable characteristics of repositories for federally funded research. But this is for all, really all of the panel. What do you think about when you think about what's an acceptable place for authors to deposit their data? I mean, I'll start by saying that um, I do believe that um, certain institutions should pay more. I do think, I think the, the amount of research coming out of institution matters. And I also think that places like Cornell should pay more than I mean, I just think that's the cost of doing business and that's what's fair. Um, but, you know, the, the university is already paying the salaries of these <laughs> researchers. And I think the university seems to think that we're on the hook for most of this. And that is really, um, it's just super challenging to be able to have that response for funding the library funding the salaries of the researchers who do the peer review, who, you know, that's a lot. And I think that, um, you know, I would love to see the, the federal government step in, but I also don't feel like that's realistic either. And so I, I feel like my role is to really come back to the university and say, how do we reimagine the funding of the university press, the library, all the APCs that are being paid you know, the page charges, like the publishing costs are not just being the library, it's the cost of the library, it's the cost of all the work being being done, the time that you need for the peer review. And I think that's the conversation that we haven't really had as not just, you know, Cornell, but AAU and, you know, like how do we think more broadly about the funding structures that we need that to support a more equitable system. And I just think we we just haven't been able to do that because I even you know at my institution is it's it's difficult because the deans are basically saying, look, I give I give all my faculty money and now they want more money for APCs. And I don't <laughs> they don't feel like they should pay for it. And then I'm like, you know, I don't have the money to pay for it. And so then the then the discussion becomes, well, who's going to pay for it? And then how are we going to recoup those costs? And so now we have to think about, well, maybe we need to revisit all those research packages that faculty get in the beginning, because now a lot of, a lot of those um, dollars are being, um, or will be spent on APCs. And that was not how those dollars were intended to be used when they were first set up. So that's just some thoughts from the university side. I think I wanna sort of uh, riff on what, what Brian said about let's find efficiencies, right? And so what I think would be more efficient is a small number of say discipline specific kinds of repositories, right? As a community, we know the kinds of data that chemists have, life sciences community has different kinds of data. So we're the best position to understand what kind of makes sense. What I don't want to see, I think, is a proliferation of lots of repositories at lots of institutions. It's duplicative efforts. And then I also worry, I don't worry about Cornell, like universities that go out of business. We're seeing that more with some small, primarily undergraduate institutions, but what happens to data then? Right. So who's got the responsibility for the maintenance for the long run? So I, I think that some centrally funded, um, probably from a number of different sources, but small number of big databases probably makes a lot of sense for us. Yeah. I would, um, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, okay, um, good. I, I would uh, very much ag agree with that around um, uh, discipline specific uh, repositories that are decided um, sort of by the community. Uh, and I think there are a lot of unanswered questions, though, around the funding of that. Um, 
Personally, I think that funders need to play their part in that. I think there was a, a, a lot of requirements coming in. I think that those are, you know, very positive, but who's going to fund it? Um, and I think that is is quite a, 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 an open and unanswered uh, question. Um, yeah, I, I also agree, building on the on the points earlier, that um, funders need to be more directly involved around the costs of the dissemination of the research that they publish, that they fund, sorry. Thank you. I'm going to circle onto a question at Zoom, and this might relate to Bob's uh, question of where he, I think he was trying to get into the data side of the conversation a little bit. Could you bring? <laughs> we have a, a document of questions here. So, thinking about the data side of this equation, um, many more questions almost in a sense because we are not working from a you know tried and true, if not quite sustainable model, as we are with publications. Um, you know, based on the experiences that have been addressed in the panel so far in terms of your your area and supporting research, um, you know, what it what how do we um, how do we support researchers um, moving towards this cultural shift that has come up in terms of their workflow, um, self deposit, who's depositing? You know, metadata, alien concept, maybe. <laughs> Melding a lot of questions here, so happy to. Well, I think, um, and again, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, DOE's <clears throat> uh, data point of contact and expert in that, but uh, the primary mechanism that uh, agencies are are going to use is this data management and sharing plan. Uh, where uh, you lay out at the beginning, you start thinking about it at the very beginning of um, how you're going to increase uh, accessibility of data that's displayed in or underlying publications, as well as uh, addressing data that's not displayed in publications and making it accessible. And um, so agencies giving attention to that, uh, rewarding and factoring that into awards themselves, uh, decisions being made later about the continuation of funding is, is kind of a carrot and stick in itself. Uh, and so there's just a lot of incentive to uh, uh, building it into the funding proposal process and, and evaluating that. And uh, so it's going to, I think, just uh, change the culture of, of how data needs to be thought about, uh, especially in the immediate access piece of it. And um, uh, then, you know, uh, ideally there would be agency ways of, of uh, rewarding that kind of behavior and in terms of universities and in DOE's case, national laboratories, uh, uh, us sending, sending a signal that we would like to see that rewarded and incentivized in different ways as well. In DOE, we have, <clears throat> as I mentioned, our 17 national laboratories. Uh, and we have, uh, uh, just like each one of us, probably as employees, we get a report card or a performance appraisal that says how we do every year. Our labs get that same kind of report card, and we've built in the public access expectations to that. And uh, so they get a grade on that on that part of it, among many other aspects of their plan. And that grade uh, translates into more money. They get a, they get a higher award fee for it. Uh, so. Uh, that's one incentive uh, that we that we're intending to use to continue to use, uh, trying to try to change the culture. Thank you. I think that there's some work too that we can do around education. So when I talked earlier about the the data help desk that we staff, it's it's staffed with a bunch of really bright. Uh, data scientists, um, some of whom came out of like the pharma industry, right? Um, and they love nothing better than talking to authors about what 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 do I do with this kind of data? How do I make it available? So uh, I don't think that you know one to one kinds of conversations are sustainable and scalable for the long run. But as we learn what kinds of questions authors ask, then we've got the ability to create better training materials, be able to work with funding agencies to say how do we how do we help your fundees um, comply with this because we have mutual um, mutual interests here. Oh, I what? like that opening to a point of conversation, Sarah. There you go. <laughs> I just wanted to add that the, you know, promotion and tenure is, that's, you know, most of the researchers we're talking about, that's that's why they're even doing all this stuff. And I think um, 
that has to evolve. And, um, and you know, I've talked to many of these P&T committees and there's still a lot of misunderstanding about what open access is, what counts. And so I think there definitely needs to be that conversation. But also, I mean, the Center for Open Science, um, shout out to Brian Nosek, is they've, they've been working on a model of change, which is always about make it rewarding, make it possible, um, make it easy. And this change has to happen in higher ed because again, P and T, but the publishers and funders also have some sticks and, and carrots too that I think are gonna help. So I think we all have to bend the incentives because I feel like there's still too many disincentives in place and people are smart. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna figure it out and um, try to find the, the fastest way to get to the, um, what to get published to get tenure. Great, thank you for those reflections. Question from the floor. Yeah. This is Mark Jones, I'm one of the CSR members. Um, I'm gonna make a comment first and then my question. The comment is you kind of, all of you went through. Can you get closer to the mic? Great. All of you so went through a, um, kind of a litany of complaints and not so much solutions. And one of the complaints I'm surprised I didn't hear was about negative, uh, publishing negative results, which seems to be an issue. The other one is about the uh, impact factor and people chasing that. But my question is, if you were not constrained by the existing system and you could design a system from scratch that would be as close to perfection as you could imagine, what would it actually look like at this point? That's my question. I'll start off. Um, I don't know if I should say this in, in public, but I actually think that I already said radical change. And I think that the, the journal has a stronghold. And I think we have to deeply revisit whether journals should exist as they do. And right now, it's, it's not the article that's important. It's the journal and its impact factor. That is a problem. And um, and I think we're just, there's too many incentives to not publish negative results. There's no incentives to think about reproducibility, replication. Like there's all these things that are in place because of the system that we have. And so I think um, impact factors have to be um, done away with. The journal has to be done away with. We have to revamp peer review. And we have to really revamp promotion and tenure too, because you know it would be nice if people just didn't publish as much and they just published the thing that was most consequential or most impactful to society. That would be much more helpful. But again, that would mean this entire system would have to be completely blown up <laughs> and rebuilt. And that's not gonna be easy. So it's very easy to say, oh, we're gonna do away with all of it. but. We have to blow it up and build it back together. And that is um, extremely radical and heretical. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people could say, oh, that's not going to work, but I don't see it working right now. So that seems to me the only recourse we have. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm a federal employee. I, I won't go, I won't lean forward as much as uh, my like from academia there uh, to, to not weigh too much into the market forces. Uh, but I do um, agree that uh, impact factor and it's really it's not so much a, it's not so much a thing that agencies can do or uh, some others can do. It's a real cultural change among the researchers themselves uh, because that's what that's what uh, they're rewarded for and it's what they seek out when they publish. And um, and when I mentioned uh, allowability and reasonableness of OA fees, uh, there's there's a, a decent correlation between the level of the OA fee and the impact journal impact factor of the journal itself, and um, uh, so that's that's an area where um, or it's almost a self reinforcing prophecy that you know if you're willing to pay a higher OA fee for a higher impact journal then they have every incentive to keep it high and keep it going higher and and so forth and so uh that's that's a topic that uh, agencies are going to need to think about when they think about uh 
allowability, uh, reasonable, reasonableness. Um, you also made a great point about uh, no incentive to publish uh, negative results and so forth. And uh, that's where I think uh, mm. we can all do more to uh, incentivize that, uh, uh, whether that be in uh, a conventional uh, published uh, journal literature or in preprints or in other kinds of great literature, uh, technical reports and this kind of thing, and to, and to do a better job of linking all those kinds of publications with the journal article, uh, so they have an expanded view of the full of full processes that went that that the research went through. Uh, so, uh, in DOE, we're we're certainly looking to uh, elevate the role of of uh, preprints and 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 some of that great literature that I talked about, so that that's also part of the uh, full scientific record. I think I agree with everything that that's been said here, and I also will reiterate: we have to think about this from a global perspective because we could say, yeah, we could re reimagine how P and T or grants are made in the U.S., but we science is global, so we have to get like everyone around the globe to go along with this too. Otherwise, the the whole system kind of falls apart. The other thing that I keep thinking about is like when I think about scientists, right? Scientists are explorers. Think about them like. The great explorers from the you know 16th and 17th centuries and they are trying to go where no one has gone before um and so how do you how do you mark what you have found what you have discovered right and, and that's the role of, of articles but you know an article today looks a lot like what it did in the 1650s um and so right now it is a very time-bound kind of artifact of 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 a piece of research so should we be looking at micro uh, releases of information? Should we tag parts of, of, of that science, that scholarly output differently? Um, I think that there are probably lots of different ways that we should be thinking about disseminating the great discoveries that these explorers have made. Shall I come in and, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't have a I don't have a huge amount to add, actually, and it's quite interesting. I think there's a lot of quite a lot of consensus. I, um, I mean, for me, again, I think actually it would be around the article, whether it's the article or a collection of research objects that come together, uh, or whether the article um, links out to those research objects. So it's a much more article centric um, uh, uh, approach and a kind of platform based approach as well, um, and how those link uh, through. Um, and I think, you know, obviously uh, the, the reward and recognition system drive a huge amount of unhelpful behaviours um, in, or, or in many aspects of, of um, scholarly communication. Uh, and I think that, you know, that, that does need to be revamped um, to, to, to drive the kind of behaviours or reward the behaviours that we've been talking about here. Um, I don't think it does uh, currently. I also think there's going to be a massive disruption around AI and how information is put into certain workflows at certain places to have, so it can be so information can be placed or knowledge can be placed to different audiences and different groups um, in the most impactful way. And I think that will will also be quite a disruptor. Question from the floor. Thank you. My name is my name is Arsalan Mirjafari. I'm a professor of chemistry at the State University of New York at Oswego. I'm a professor at a public PUI, primarily undergraduate institution. So I have a two component question. One for publishers. Uh, having access to open access journals is critically important for my students and my faculty because we receive a huge budget cut. Our library received a huge budget cut after COVID. And we pretty much lost access of all the journals we had. Question number one for the publisher is, first part of actually my question for publishers, is, is there any incentives or a support mechanism for the faculty from resource limited institution? Uh, I know Sarah said ACS has that. I'd never seen it, honestly. But uh, we published it, we accepted the paper this morning in Chemcom and uh, to publish it open access needs 2,500 pounds. I understand this is not much money for a well TPIs in the biggest schools, but it's a lot of money for me and for my institution. Second part of my question is for federal agencies. 
NIH requires new document called uh, data sharing plan to store meta uh, data. When I was writing that um, document for my R15, R15 is for the resource limited institution. Uh, it's a funding mechanism. And I realized those repositories are quite expensive, but the budget for the R15 is still $300,000 for three years. I had to pick one of them. So I cut the budget from the students uh, stipends and my uh, supplies, which it's pretty hard to carry out the research now. So second part of the question, is there any mechanism for the PUI faculty or research limited PIs to be still stay competitive and publish the results? Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Who would like to comment? I guess maybe uh, I'm happy to to get some more information to you about our, our program with PUIs. So stay tuned. Emma? We also, as I said, we do um, also have um, uh, yeah, pro programs where we do um, support and help uh, researchers that ha uh, ha are less well funded. Um, uh, so there's information available on our website for some of those, and then some of those uh, are done um, through communication with the journal uh, as well. Uh, thank you for the question about uh, for the agencies on the data repository piece. Um, a couple of different angles there, uh, and I know it's not uh, either immediately going to solve uh, your question or uh, uh, in any case, completely. Uh, but, but as you as you noted, there this is a requirement for a data management plan now called data data management sharing plan. And uh, so, in that, uh, again, I'm not uh, DOE's lead on that, but I know that the intent there is that uh, that that will be uh, a, D, a DMSP will be required in a funding proposal, and it and it lays out. Uh, uh, where you where you intend to uh, make uh, data, especially data underlined or displayed in publications, and even data not displayed in publications, uh, made accessible, hopefully, hopefully using the desirable a desirable characteristics repository, and uh, to uh, lay out the cost of that, and that and that would be funded as part of the uh, of the uh, overall award, uh, rather than <clears throat> something that the uh, university itself is expected to foot. Um, but this is also going to be kind of a learn as we go process too. you know, that uh, some of the uh, some of the third party repositories that meet these characteristics, if they're not if it's not something that's offered by your institution, uh, carry a lot of costs themselves and something that uh, will inform us as to like, is this something uh, we're willing to uh, keep funding uh, as a cost of doing business without additional funding from Congress or taking, you know, taking the money away from research. And so we are exploring uh, alternatives, uh, sort of uh, agency agency provided repositories that would would solve some of these issues. Uh, that's going to be some time in the making, but we're developing uh, clear use cases like what you're describing here. So uh, we uh, have 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 some decisions to make whether the agency itself, uh, for certain use cases, is going to uh, provide a repository uh, and not and not. Um, push that cost onto the uh, university or so forth. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. I just wanted to acknowledge that there are a lot of questions, especially coming in through chat, um, some in that theme of sustainability that we've been exploring for a while, um, and then others around uh, research integrity. I was thinking we could move into that topic a little bit, but I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, we will try to follow up Further, we'll share the questions around with all the panelists as well, and hopefully uh, support ongoing conversations around these topics. So if we don't get to your thing today, <laughs> there will be more coming. Um, I just wanna take one Zoom question and then we'll go back to the room. Um, so here's a question, and this I could probably kind of uh, directed at Brian originally, but other thoughts are welcome as well. Um, why don't federal agencies actually fund negative results in reproducibility studies? <laughs> 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 
Why don't federal agencies actually fund negative results and reproducibility? Researchers don't do it, they don't publish these because they can't be funded. So I wouldn't totally agree with that that's the case. Uh, we, uh, uh, it's typically not the case that you're going to you're going to publish those uh, results in journal articles. Uh, but especially with our grants, uh, we and, and with our national laboratories, uh, we uh, require a technical report to be uh, uh, submitted. Submitted. Uh, uh, it can be superseded if, if a journal article uh, is otherwise covering that same kind of material, they don't have to submit a technical report. But a technical report is the perfect place to get into uh, uh, all, all the methods that were used. A technical report can be much longer than a journal article, and it can get into uh, the negative results. Uh, so uh, it is funded. It, it's it's, uh, it's uh, uh, a clear mechanism and avenue for providing that uh, uh, those results. And, and, and everybody throughout history of science has seen great value and not just as successes, but things that did not uh, pan out, and because that's as uh, uh, elucidating and educational to others as as something that was very successful. So um, uh, there is there's language in terms and conditions of an award that says you can submit a technical report, and and the technical report can include just as many negative negative outcomes as uh, positive outcomes. So uh, uh, there there is the possibility of doing that. Uh, and, uh, I hope I answered the question and maybe didn't miss the point. I might have missed the point too. <laughs> I mean, I think I think we there have been ideas of of well, let's share more data, let's share more negative results as well as things that support our conclusions. So I think that we're trying to get our heads around how do we make that happen. Uh, I don't know if the others on the panel have perspective on on the editorial process around negative results and publications that are relevant here. <laughs> I, I can ahead, add Emma. the Chem Archive um, welcomes uh, preprints with neg uh, negative results. Um, we've talked about that, um, uh, you know, with Chem Archive in our um, ownership board meetings, and I think at, probably at the editorial advisory board meetings as well. So certainly welcome those. Thank you for that. Olaf? Hi, uh, Olaf Wiest, um, University of Notre Dame and director of CCAS. Um, so a lot of the discussion so far went to things, how do we build the system in the future based on mandates? Um, how about the old stuff, right? So how about looking at the past and a slide that Elaine showed in her presentation kind of stuck to my mind on this you know, ginormous wrecks of data. Uh, Brian's comment about technical reports. Yeah, we got those in science. We call them PhD theses. Um, how do we bring this information, which most distinctively is not fair or any of that sort or open? How do we bring that information in? And do we need to plan on this? Is building this system part of verifying uh, the past. Say, you know, a lot of publishers have spent a lot of time a while ago now, right? Digitizing their back files, the stuff that existed only in prints. Um, and that is important because it helps preserve the, the rest of scholarship. It makes it more readily available. I think too, like as we consider the future and adding more data, um, there are electrical costs uh, to that too. It's not just shelf space anymore, right? It's it's what what's our carbon footprint look like too? And so, uh, I guess you know that there, there's the question of like kind of ROI, right? What ROI for the planet, really, frankly. Um, and you know, the the question that's kind of going through my head is as Elaine had that great picture of the of the annex up there is like, how many copies of stuff do we need, right? Does every university need to preserve the same kinds of things? I, I don't know the right answer to that. That is is your domain for sure. Um, but those are questions I think we need to grapple with too. Yeah, I mean I would say that um that 
that annex, I mean, we're talking about every, all the big research libraries have annexes and they usually start up at 3 million titles, right? And so we call it um, collections as data. And we believe that these collections are locked, right? That they are, um, many of them are analog and we have to find ways. And we believe that artificial intelligence might be one of the tools to unlock these collections, make them available. Um, and it's, you know, many of the back files are being digitized, but there's still a lot of print. Um, a lot of the things we get from um, Southeast Asia, you know, parts of the world are still very much in print. And um, and then we have these manuscripts and we have history of science, philosophy of science, history of medicine. These are manuscripts and things and collections that are not um, digital right, at all. And so I do think you're raising a good point. And I think on the other side, when we think of the front list and the new things are coming out, I am worried because some of the subscription models we have, you know, once we cancel titles, we lose access. And so then I start to think about portico and clocks and locks and, and those groups that are really looking at um, preserving serials for the um, next generation. And I think um, to Sarah's point, we talk a lot about how many records, how many, how many copies do we need? Where do they need to be? Um, that's a conversation we've had for many, many years in the library profession. And I think we've, we definitely don't all want to have, we can't afford to keep the same stuff, but as we digitize, make it more available, then we have to worry about the storage costs and Amazon and AWS. And all that. Like it's, it's expensive to preserve things forever. And that's what libraries do, whether it's an analog or digital. I actually feel much better about the, the analog stuff. Like we know how to preserve books for a couple hundred years. Um, we are not as reliable when it comes to digital content. And we have a lot more standards now, but I still feel like that's a little more precarious than the, than the analog stuff. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just add. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, we have a uh, my presentations show that we've been around since 1947, so we have content um, between the 40s and the 90s uh, that was non-digital, and uh, we've been chipping away at getting that digitized and uh, issuing digital object identifiers for those uh, for those publications. And our hope is that as people uh, write new articles that they'll reference back to these things, use them as part of their research efforts. And uh, so that's our goal is to, is to see more and more of that legacy content brought into the uh, referential material for uh, publications. So uh, it's a big thing for us. We have a goal of getting all of that content digitized by 2029. Uh, and so we hope to see that being reflected more and more in the, in the uh, reference uh, material of uh, journal, journal articles. Thank you, Emma. Did you have a, anything to add? No, no, not on this one, I don't think. I think everything's kind of been said. Thank you. Marty, from the Great. floor. Thanks so much. Marty Burke, uh, University of Illinois and CSR member. I liked what many of you said about coupling open access to better science that could better society. And in that vein, I think one of the things we haven't talked a lot about is just getting access doesn't actually get us there. It needs to be actionable. Right. So if we just check the box and technically it's accessible, but someone who really wants to make a difference isn't able to leverage that information, then it doesn't really move the needle. So one of the really, I think, excellent examples of this is what NASA did with the Planet Hunters program. I think it's such a cool example of intentionally democratizing discovery in a way that was just hugely successful. So they took all the deep space telescope images and actually made them available with mechanisms for people to engage. So hobbyists can find exoplanets hundreds of millions of light years away because that data is not only accessible, but it's actionable. So I'm wondering how we might think about making the data and all the publications more accessible, but also more actionable. And this is where I think the question about machine learning and machine readability becomes super important because finding one paper that you can take to your doctor, okay, that's one thing, but finding patterns, right, across lots of literature that's coming from all these different places and seeing trend lines emerge and being able to make hypotheses and predictions, that's a whole nother thing. And this is where machine learning and AI could actually turn into a tremendous enabler of democratizing science. So I'm just really curious to think about, you know, your thoughts, how do we make it more actionable so that we can achieve the ultimate goal of bettering science and society? 
think we weren't even having conversations like this a year and a half ago, right? So I think it's kind of one of those it's cop out, but let's let's wait and see because I think that you're right. The ability of of large language models and whatever comes after that to um, generate new information to generate insights, I think is really important and and that's going to change. I think the other part of your question though is equally interesting. How do we engage the hobbyists? How do we engage kids? How do we get people excited about science? Because ultimately, if we have a science literate uh, electorate, right, that that helps all of us, because maybe we, Congress won't be so locked up about funding, I, I, you know, whatever, pipe dreams. Um, but I think that that's so critical to us. I think, um, man, science has solved so many problems and, and fundamental science has solved, has led to so many interesting questions that lead to uh, solutions to real life problems that from my perspective, it's really getting to people at younger times in their life to get them excited about science so that when they you know, are uh, of voting age, they can help elect people who care about science too. And I know we're running out of time. I'll just say uh, a great point. And I think uh, there is a difference between sort of citizen science and let's say uh, the more uh, uh, sophisticated uh, channels that some of our universities and laboratories take advantage of machine readable content and, and AI practices and so forth. So um, <clears throat> I'm not sure quite how to crack the nut on the uh, on just sort of the citizen science, science piece of it other than just uh, ensuring that they have access to these systems. But um, as the OSTP memo uh, pointed out, uh, big, a big emphasis there is in machine readability, which enables these large language models and AI practices and so forth that the universities and the, and the national laboratories and even the commercial sector. And, and this is mostly done through uh, uh, agencies offering application programming infra interfaces for them to be to go into large scale use of, uh, of this information and, and establish new patterns of discovery and so forth. And so uh, that's going to be a big emphasis of ours so that uh, we don't just realize this sort of incremental processes, but just like totally new discoveries. I think, um, oh, sorry, is that okay? Um, I mean, I complete, I mean, uh, open access and one of the, the visions for open access was certainly in the UK, actually the UK government, it was all about machine reading as well. It was about being able to mine the corpus and, 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 and to drive innovation. It wasn't just about access for taxpayers. Um, so absolutely, you know, AI is going to make um, huge use of the open access um, corpus and deliver information and 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 serve back that knowledge in completely different 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 ways that's happening um, now. Elaine, any last thoughts on that question? I can say that um, I just came from a meeting and we were talking about uh, newspapers as the cultural heritage of this country and being. Uh, using machine learning to um, open up that data and then use crowdsourcing to actually clean it up, right? Because artificial intelligence is not very good at lots of things, um, particularly with um, 19th century newspapers. And that's something that the Library of Congress is working on. And, you know, I'm interested in Cornell and other places working with that. So I think that that is really important that we jump on this and leverage the technology as much as possible because you know as we keep saying there's so much stuff out there that is not um, in the hands of our scholars everybody thinks everything is digital it is not digital and if it is digital that doesn't mean it's actually useful right and we also know all the biases and things and problems with ai too that it's not going to solve every problem either but it is quite promising All right, I think on that aspirational note, we'll think about lunch. <laughs> but I appreciate I appreciate hearing the the breadth of concerns as well as opportunities. Um, I think it's great that all of these issues are coming up. Lots of unsolved questions, but that that's what advances the community conversation. Um, and we'll have more opportunity to dig into both the data part this afternoon and then tomorrow we're talking more about how to support the research community. So more opportunity then. Um, just want to thank everyone so far for your questions, and we'll be following up, um, you know, with with 
further information on on these topics after the meeting as well. Thank you and have a great lunch.